Hello. Welcome to my sample video for my presentation on the topic of strategy and competition. This is a business strategy presentation that applies to a wide variety of audiences and I think it somewhat speaks for itself so I'm going to get started a little bit. We're going to talk about the fundamentals and then we'll move into th through some of the tools that you use. Then we'll do some of the different kinds of strategies. That's always the fun part. And then we'll conclude talking about how the function of strategy fits in with organizations. And uh, generally speaking, the strategies and some of the factors and strategic decisions is probably the part that I would most blow up in a live presentation. I get through the fundamentals. I'm going to cover those pretty thoroughly. This is the most fun part, and that's what you get more of in uh, a live presentation. But with that in mind, let's go ahead and get started. Let's talk a little bit about the fundamentals. Um, I always start off by talking a little bit about competition, and I put a question mark there for a very legitimate reason. When you are, uh, especially if you're from a capitalist background, like uh, you're raised and, and start your career here in the United States, we oftentimes hear a lot about the importance of competition and how it makes businesses perform better and how it's good for society. And that's true, but it's not necessarily good for uh, business themselves. It's not good for profits or returns. Competition is a, uh, a little bit of a trick and the first thing I, I start off with this in fundamentals because I want to challenge some of that conventional thinking that the audience oftentimes has because if you look at something like a direct competition I'll use the example of a price war. It doesn't have to be a price war. You, sometimes you compete over features, sometimes you compete over um, uh, terms. Uh, of your contracts, but there's sort of that competition. What happens is, in theory, uh, there is a, a price, let's use price as an example, there's a price at which the buyer is willing to pay, and of course they're always willing to pay lower than that. They, they want to get some value themselves, the end customer. But when you have a price war, the competing companies bid that price down to where all of the value accrues to the customer and the companies themselves can't make a, a, a return. And so the important thing to remember is, you know, in a capitalist system, the uh, competition works. As a matter of fact, it works so well that as a business, your interests are in actually avoiding competition. And that's a little bit hard for some people to uh, get their head around. But what I say is, look, you, you usually can't get away with having no competition. There's uh, oftentimes you'll, you'll have government regulators break you up if you become a monopoly. Um, uh, but you can oftentimes end up with what I call indirect competition. So you want to differentiate yourself. You want to cultivate strategic assets, we'll get to this in a minute, that are different from your competition. You don't want to get head to head. You want to somehow differentiate yourself. And that's uh, uh, a little bit um, against some of what we think of as capital, uh, the, the nature we have as capitalists because we, we've been raised to think that competition is such a good thing, it's important to remember that, that then the value accrues to the customer. That might be a little bit against our nature, you know, if we learn to compete in sports or something and sportsmanlike conduct is uh, uh, valued, um, now you actually want to uh, uh, press your advantage. And I'll, I'll give you an example of how sometimes that can challenge people's conventions. Um, I, I always give the example, have you ever had that guy at work and whose job is completely secure because he's the only one who knows how to do something or work a machine and so when there's layoffs it's never going to be he who gets laid off and you might become resentful towards that guy because you're like look he's really not anything special he just has this select piece of knowledge but it's important to note in strategy that's kind of the guy you want to be you want to have an advantage that other people can't emulate and you want to press that advantage and that can sometimes be a little bit against our, our sort of sportsman-like nature. But it's important to note that being indirect is not the same as being unlawful. It doesn't have, it's not, not necessarily shady or illegal. You just want to press your advantage, your scale advantage, your brand advantage. We'll get to assets in a minute. Um, another example I always like to get is, uh, is um, a friend of mine was working on, uh, in agriculture in Peru. And they, they make a certain kind of corn there that only grows in that part of the world. And there was a, a, a distributor who sort of managed to corner the market on distributing this. It was, he said it was hard for him to make any money because all of the value accrued to the distributor because he had all the client contacts. And, and he was resent, you know, sort of cursing this man. And I said, look, in business, that man is kind of who you want to be. Um, so bear that in mind. Uh, let's move on a little bit. The, the reason you want to have a, an, an ind you want to have a good strategy is, is this. If you take companies and you divide them by the top third in terms of return on investment, the top third, the medium, middle third, and the lower third, over time those companies tend to aggregate 
to the average. This doesn't have to be zero necessarily. Maybe there's a return on investment. Uh, this is the sort of cost of capital it'll, it'll aggregate to, but it's hard to maintain a, a high level. And so that's really what strategy is all about. It's getting to and maintaining this high level of return. You want to beat this system, you want to buck the system a little bit. So those are a couple of counterintuitive points that I want to uh, bring up uh, just to sort of get our head around uh, strategy. So, so you might ask, well, Keith, if we want to be uh, indirect, if we want to differentiate ourselves, if we want to have an advantage and press it, what kind of advantages are you talking about? Well, the first thing you want to have is you have to, ha you have to identify what your strategic assets are. And I'll give you some examples. The most common ones are your brand. People recognize your, your, your brand as a differentiator, and that's something that costs money to uh, accumulate, to develop. Um, also, scale advantages. If you have a uh, an industry with a large economies of scale, you want to uh, obviously have the largest scale, and that can be an advantage that others can't emulate because they can't catch up with you because you have a lower cost structure and you can handle a price war better than they can. Um, another one is network effects. You'll see this a lot with the social networking. This is why Twitter and Facebook should, in theory, have some level of security because you can't just switch from Facebook to something else. You have to get all your friends on the something else as well. And so the network effect there is a um, strategic advantage. Also, there's customer loyalties. If customers are hesitant to take on, uh, try something new, if you've got a relationship, uh, you know they they know that they can trust you that you get the job done. They might be hesitant. They're switching costs to trying someone else because they might not. So that's a uh, customer loyalty is your asset, your customer relationship, and um, also reputation. I use the example of Warren Buffett. He works in a lot of regulated industries like uh, the energy industry, and regulators are always happy to let him invest because they know that he has a history of of working there. And this is kind of like a variation of brand or customer loyalty. His reputation is that uh, you know, they'd rather have him buy it than someone else because someone else is an unknown entity. They know that he can tr they can trust him because he's got you know, decades of, of history. And so you want to have strategic assets. You also want to have asymmetries. And uh, oh, um, let me say one more thing on assets, that you want them to be difficult to emulate. You want something that, you know, look, if, if any, uh, anybody off the street can develop the same kind of asset, if, if, if it's a, an industry where the new hot brand and like a fashion is always the new thing, then it's hard to make that an asset because other people can emulate it. They can be the newer, hotter thing. Um, you also want to be asymmetric. This gets back to our indirect competition. So if someone, uh, so if uh, Coke is the leader and Pepsi are the leaders by brand, to challenge Coke and Pepsi, you want to do something slightly different. You want to offer a different product that's not cola or you want to be like the generic brand. You want to uh, at, the, at the shelf, the, the store brand, the private label brand. That's an asymmetry. You don't go after the competitors head on. You do something slightly different. Um, another important point on what you want to have for a strategy is you, uh, there, there's always the issue of disruption. Um, a good example of this is when I worked in the printing business, we were selling, you know, when printers became uh, able to do copying and um, faxing, we, we put them into rep to replace the copy machines. And a lot of the copy companies were making high margins because they were selling leases for very expensive copiers and we could um, undercut them on price by selling printers that were hundreds of dollars whereas these copiers cost thousands and, and, and as the technology got better we were able to disrupt them and this gets into a little bit the innovators dilemma but the issue with disruption is for the copier makers they they couldn't lower their price to compete with us because that's significantly decreasing their profit but we as an upstart could do that because it was all found business to us. We didn't have a legacy business that was higher. Any account that we could throw them out of was a, a net gain for us. And so we, we didn't have the innovator's dilemma because we were an independent entity. They had the innovator's dilemma. They had the conflict there. Um, another uh, important point on the fundamentals is the market development. You want to essentially develop the market. If, you have, if you're early enough and strong enough to have an impact on how this market develops, you want to drive it to the assets that you are strong in. So for example, if you have a lot of scale and someone else comes up with a branding strategy, you want to drive the basis of competition towards scale. So you might actually want to induce a price war so that they can differentiate themselves less on brand. You want to try and drive the market to the assets that you possess. And you might not be able to get 100% of the market because of uh, asymmetries, you're trying to do things differently, but you want to drive the bulk of it to where you have an advantage. And the la uh, last couple points are sort of contradictions to these good strategies, uh, sort of differences from good strategies, except, uh, 
uh, sort of some conflicts. Oftentimes you'll hear people talk about operations. We want really efficient operational excellence or we want to be the innovative leader. Those have actually proven to be more direct competition and as a result um, they tend to not uh, be able to sustain these hard returns on investment. In other words, strategic assets, operational excellence typically isn't. Uh, scale might be, but, but actually being the best at execution uh, has not been proven sustainable, research shows, over the long term. Same thing even with innovation. It's a very hot topic right now. Everybody wants a speech on innovation, but the truth is um, innovation is hard to keep ahead on. You actually, uh, some people would think of these as uh, sort of necessary but not sufficient. If you're going to have a company, it's good to have good operations and good innovation, but that won't get you high returns. You have to have another strategic asset, a scale, a brand, a customer relationship, a network effect to uh, get the high uh, get the higher returns. Good I use uh, Microsoft as the example here. In the 90s, they were the desktop standard and most of the companies used their software and you were changing files, sharing files. They all had to be on the same Office platform, uh, Windows Office. And what you found is they might not have been necessarily been the best operator. They had a lot of crashes in their system. It wasn't necessarily as reliable as uh, some people say the Unix, the Apple, the Linux. Um, nor was it necessarily the leader in innovation. But everybody used it anyway and we just cursed about it. That's the classic example of like that guy I said. That's the guy you can't, has that barrier. You can't seem to replace him. Um, and so these might not, in, in extreme forms, these might not even be necessary. You might, uh, I said necessary but not sufficient for high returns. They might not even be necessary if your strategic assets are strong enough. You can sort of cover a lot of operational executional errors and lagging in innovation if you've got enough barriers here in your assets. And the last point I want to talk about is a lot of strategy isn't about choosing what to do, it's about choosing what not to do. The most common strategic mistake is to have a part of your industry that is large or growing quickly and Wall Street says, well, you've got to get, you got to grow, you got to get into that area. And the truth is, if you don't have a strategic advantage, if your assets don't play there, you usually end up going into it out of pressure from, from shareholders or Wall Street and end up uh, wasting a lot of money because you don't have that advantage that's differentiated there. So those are some of the fundamentals of strategy, how to think about it. Let's talk about some of the tools we use. Um, I'll go through these quickly. These are like analysis tools. One of them is the SWOT analysis. This is strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. This is a common sort of layout for people in their, a lot of companies have a strategy process. And what they do is they look at the, what their strengths are relative to their competitors, those assets, the weaknesses where they're uh, uh, not asymmetric or their competitors have better assets. Opportunities are like market segments that are growing and threats are ways in which they could themselves be disrupted. Um, so that's one tool of analysis. Another one is the five forces. This, I put six here because I like to throw in my own sixth force, but this was a uh, Michael Porter at the Harvard Business School talks a lot about this. Um, it's where, you know, we tend to think of our competition as with our um, competitors. But it's important to note that there's really quite a bit more to it than that. As I mo no mentioned here back when, when I talked about competition directly, you, there's actually a value chain. There's a willingness to pay at the end of the customer and there's a cost for raw materials. If you're manufacturing, I'll use that as an example. Um, something else for services. And, and really through that whole value chain, you're competing with everybody for value. You're competing with competitors for market share, but you're also competing with your customers. You know, you want a bigger share of that willingness to pay. You want to figure out how to charge them a higher price. Your suppliers are trying to rise their price to you. You're trying to push them down. So there's really all of these things. Rivalry is your competition with your direct competitors. Um, suppliers are obviously suppliers, customers, the people you're selling to. There's also substitutes. You know, if, you get, if your price gets too high, people will look to use uh, a replacement. And of course, there's also new entrants. These are people trying to enter. They're not currently in the rivals. Uh, and you want what, what's oftentimes called a barrier to entry. You want an industry where it's hard for them to um, enter. A good example of that is, um, you know, it's oftentimes very common among financiers. They like to talk about what you want is a low asset business. There's no investment because you can get a high return on investment because the investment's so low. And what they miss when they jump to that conclusion, what they oftentimes skip is the analogy of, look, if there's a high investment in the industry, then it can keep out entrance because once you're established, other people can't enter. And so a low asset business means, yeah, you can enter it, but so can everybody else. And it sort of depends on which side of that you're on. It's, uh, you might want a low entry, uh, uh, low asset might be good for an entrant, but then you got to realize once you get in there, um, you're going to have other people entering and that's going to keep your returns uh, low. Um, another thing that is important to, and under tools is the market sizing tools. Uh, this gets back a little bit to what I was talking about here with the um, uh, 
deciding what not to do if there's a large market or a growing market uh, tends to uh, uh, get everybody into it, but you wanna know what the market size is before you get there. Um, this is a common consulting thing that you get hired to um, uh, size the market. I always like to point out that uh, that's necessary because you do have to plan to something, but first of all, your estimates are always wrong. They, you, the only thing you know for sure is that, they, that you don't know what that will be. It will be different than what you expect. And the most important thing that I think most people miss is it's not just the size and the growth, it's your competitive advantage. Do your assets play there? Do you have an asymmetry? Do not get busy chasing all of the big exciting markets. Um, one more thing I forgot to mention on five forces. My sixth force, these are the five conventional ones, suppliers, substitutes, customers, rivalry, entrants. Um, I like to talk about what I call context. A lot of this can be affected by things like government intervention, regulation, also political activism. So if you're Apple and you're making iPhones, you can't necessarily go to the cheapest company because if you end up working, having sweatshop labor or if you're a uh, retailer outsourcing clothes, um, the activists will expose you and it'll be bad for your brand. So there's context involved in that as well. Um, that's my personal contribution. That's the, what I call the sixth force. Um, let's get back. We talked about market sizing, get back on track. Uh, key success factors. This is kind of a way of identifying what the uh, assets are, not just in your company, but you want to match them to the industry themselves. What are the key success factors? So if you're in a commodity business, it's good to have scale because you're the low cost producer. But you don't want to end up being trying to become a branded industry. Uh, you know, putting uh, oftentimes a, a company that's tired of working in a commodity business will want to have a premium brand. And if there's uh, if that's a key success factor in their industry, that can be very useful. But trying to convince people that a commodity should be branded if it's not a key success factor is a waste of time. You don't want to be branded in a commodity market. You don't want to be commoditized in a branded market. You, uh, uh, you know, we tried this with uh, when I worked in the printing business, the printer business. Uh, uh, we tried to make uh, technology exciting for printing, and it turns out people just don't really care that much about exciting printers. It's not. They don't identify with it as closely as they do in their iPhone or their, their tablet computer. Printers are a little bit of a, a backwater in the tech business. So we uh, spent some money and didn't get much for it. And the last tool I want to talk about is core analysis. This is kind of getting to what your core strategic assets are. There was a, and you want to build off of those. There was a guy named uh, Chris Zook who wrote a famous book called Profit from the Core. And the premise of the book, I'll give you a 10 second summary, is that um, if you're trying to grow your business, the first thing you have to do is have your core assets, your core business um, in a strengthened position because trying to build, uh, expand your business outside of the core because the core is weak, re research shows that doesn't work very well. You want to shore up your core first. Also, you want to build from that. So if you're you know, in a certain product market, you want to build up products that have a similar, um, a very similar industry. You don't want to go from making, you know, uh, making cars to making movies. Those are two different and, and those tend to fail. And his premise is the, uh, the further you get from your core, the lower the probability of success of expanding your business into that. It was kind of a growth uh, discussion. Um, and the last thing I want to say is if it is a core business, you don't want to outsource that. Um, I'm re uh, reading right now uh, Tony Shea's book, uh, Zappos, and he's, he's important to note out. He actually brought, he had outsourced his uh, inventory, uh, his dis distribution of the, they're an online shoe seller for those of you that don't know, and he'd outsourced his distribution and he actually brought it back in because he wanted to differentiate on um, customer service and other companies couldn't do that as well. They had commoditized customer service. It's hard for him to give his best um, example of that. And uh, this gets a little bit back to what we talked about with you know low asset businesses. Uh, your, uh, if, if your key success factor is your scale and your assets, your manufacturing capacity, that's for you, then you don't want to outsource that. Uh, retailers oftentimes, I've never understood this, they, they'll outsource the stocking of their shell, or I, the stocking of the shelves I understand, the, the layout of the shelves, who gets what space to a supplier, and the suppliers are usually biased, and, and I've always considered that a bit of outsourcing your core business. Those are some tools. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some strategies that I like. Um, these are uh, uh, some, some things to consider right when developing your strategy. One is you have the classic chicken and the egg problem. This is from the old metaphor, what comes, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? And it can oftentimes get hard to start things. So for example, if you are um, uh, 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 doing a computer platform, 
people might not want to buy your computer unless there are applications for it. But the application developers don't want to develop application until there's a big supply of people who have the, the computer. So the, an installed base. So there's sort of a chicken and the egg problem there. A good example of that is what Microsoft and Nokia face right now in the cell phone market. There are not, uh, right now, most applications are available on the Android operating system or the I Apple iPhone operating system. And now they're br no Microsoft is bringing out their Windows 8 mobile platform with their, with their Nokia partner. And it's yet to be seen if application developers are going to be willing to develop the applications for it, which means they won't sell the phones if they don't, which means that they won't, you know, it sort of becomes a vicious cycle. And uh, right now, applications are pretty already on two platforms. It's not sure, it's not clear that they'll be willing to support a third. Um, another consideration is the cannibalization. This is oftentimes if you want to sell another product, uh, an incremental product by expanding your product line, some sales from that new product might be uh, new, a net gain, but otherwise you can't just assume that everyone is, an, is a positive because some of them might come as substitutes from your other product. You might just be switching people from one product to another. Jeep had this uh, issue when they brought out the um, Jeep Commander. It was a third row of seats and they thought this is great. Our current Jeep Grand Cherokee has two rows of seats so we'll get more customers. And it turns out they did grow. There were people who bought the Commander but a lot of them were just switching up from the Grand Cherokee. So they didn't get a much, as much net gain. They cannibalized. They ate their own product from that. Um, another example or pardon me, another type of strategy is the pricing umbrella. This is oftentimes an issue that you get into with like premium brands versus value brands. They've differentiated themselves. There's an asymmetry. But in certain industries, like we had this in computer printers, where H we were at Lexmark, a smaller competitor, value brand in the consumer space, HP had both more scale, so they had a cheaper cost and a better brand. So we kind of lived and died at, at their um, at their mercy. And what would happen is, uh, you know, if we lowered our price and started to grow our share, they would, at first, when you go from 0% to 5% share and they had, you know, 90% share, it didn't make sense for them to lower cost on 90% of the market to just squeeze you out of the last five. But once you get to about 20 or 30%, all of a sudden it becomes worth their while. They say, they see the trend and say, we're going to, we're going to put a, put our foot on their throat and they lower their price for the whole bulk of it. And all of a sudden they can squeeze you out because they have the assets, both price and brand. Same thing happened in uh, cola with Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola going after some of the department store value brands. They just lower their price if they get too much momentum. Um, another strategy is the harvest strategy. This is like, look, what do you do when uh, your assets aren't as valuable and the, your return on investment, you don't see a path to getting even back up to the cost of capital. What do we do? Well, one thing you should do is harvest. And this means ending the business, essentially. Uh, you, you stop development of new products and new factories and you just milk incremental profit, you pr harvest the work that you've already done, and once it's done, you close the factory and sell it. Now, that's not something that you necessarily want to do, but sometimes it's inevitable. I think Kodak was in this situation where they, uh, digital photo their, their main profit center was selling chemically processed film, and now we're not using film, we're using digital photography and oftentimes even digital distribution. We don't need to print the things or, or use film to collect them. And they said, well, we're going to go into printers and we're going to go into healthcare markets. And they spent a lot of money and now they're basically bankrupt because the reality is they should have just recognized that this wasn't going anywhere and they should have harvested. And one of the dangers that you run into here is that investors, if, if it's inevitable, investors want to harvest, but executives don't want to be the guy who ran the company into the ground. So oftentimes they're hesitant to do this and there's sort of a, a disagreement there. And uh, executives might tr invest a bunch of money and to buy a bunch of market share to create the illusion they've grown it and then switch companies saying that it's been fine and then it all collapses and it's left with the shareholders to uh, as the fault. Another strategy is what I call the cherry picker. Um, this is where the companies come along, a competitor comes along and uh, if it's expensive to sort of have all the markets, all the products and services in the market to, to provide all a broad set, they pick just the ones that are profitable and they avoid the expense of the all. This is where if you have lost leaders, um, they pick just the fruitful ones and ignore the lost leaders. A good example of this is the airline industry. Um, a lot of the full service airlines have hub and spoke systems and they serve a lot of underdeveloped markets and those, are, th those can be expensive because not all of them are very profitable. But if you're a large airline and you've got a big frequent flyer program, your customers want you, your airline to take them anywhere. So you have to run some legs that aren't very profitable. But if you are a uh, a value airline like a Southwest or an Allegiant or Spirit, they go up and just look, well, you know, if there's, ten, uh, you know, 100 routes that you could run, 
but only 30 of them are profitable, we're just gonna supply those 30. And this is really hard if you've got the cost structure of a full provider, because they pull uh, the, the profit out of the, the 30 that are still profitable. And closely related to this idea is what I call the first mover advantage, which is where um, this is where, you know, we talked about assets can be a credible threat. If it's expensive to enter a market, you can enter and you're the first mover, you enter, you establish yourself, and now it's hard for entrants to come in because once they get in, they just have rivalry with you who's already established and there'll be no profit. So it creates a, a, a disincentive, a, a barrier for them to enter. And so that's the first, what's called a first mover advantage. But there's also something which is a subsequent mover advantage, second, third, fourth. And that is, let's say you're going into a developing country and uh, we use the example in business school, selling razor blades to uh, Indonesians and Gillette was the case. And, and the fact is they had to go in there and they had to spend a lot of money to basically teach people to shave. It wasn't very culturally, it wasn't as culturally common there. People had beards. Uh, and that was fine. And so once they spent all the money, then others could come in and they could start selling razor blades, but they wouldn't have to go through the education expense because the, the first mover had already paid for everyone. So the second mover actually has a cost advantage there. And the last one I want to talk about is the squeeze play. This is where you oftentimes get uh, a, a war on two fronts. You get attacked from two sides. A good example of this is uh, Blockbuster right now. Um, Blockbuster, uh, the video rental place, they used to have, uh, you know, sort of be in every uh, local strip mall in town and you would go there, they had a decent selection and uh, they had reasonably low prices, but they got attacked on both ends because uh, most of their volume was the new releases, the hits, and Redbox started offering just the hits. It was sort of a cherry picker strategy. We'll just take the hits and the, the high volume ones and put them, stock them in these little boxes and we don't have to pay for a whole uh, building and a whole staff. Uh, but on the other side of that, where what you say, well, Blockbuster has a better variety, but those people started going to Netflix because Netflix, being mail order, had an even larger variety warehoused and you might have to wait a day or two, but you could get it um, from Netflix. So Blockbuster ended up with almost no pro value proposition. Like the hits went to Redbox, the, the variety went to Netflix, and they were stuck in the middle with a big uh, leasing expenses and, and uh, staff expenses. So those are some strategies. I do a little bit more of those in the uh, live presentation. This is also closely related to my presentation on business models, which I'll get to, uh, uh, which will also be on the website. Um, last thing I wanna talk about is how does the function of strategy fit in an organization? Well, for one thing, um, how it works as a career can be a little bit um, interesting. Now it's very core to the business, but because it's relatively young as a functional area, uh, finance, marketing, operations, these are a little bit more mature. It usually gets placed underneath one of those areas. Now it can be a good place to start your career or to uh, learn about a new business or a new industry, but it's rare that those people will make uh, imp important decisions. It tends to be kind of an advisory capacity. You're advising the business unit heads. Um, sometimes it's under the finance. I worked in a strategy department under both marketing and then another one under the, fi the chief financial officer. Um, so career-wise, it's more of a means to an end than an end itself, unless of course you're just happy being the anal analyst. But if you want to be the boss, you usually have to go somewhere else. Um, where it fits in with the structure, um, like I said, sometimes it's finance, also marketing, operations. Uh, directly to the CEO, but it, it can oftentimes end up being like an HR function. It's important and in theory one of the most important in the businesses, but not the ones that make the decisions that drive the businesses. Um, also, the uh, uh, it's uh, oftentimes is end up in finance because it ends up being part of the planning cycle, and I'm a mixed feelings about that. Um, it's easy to have something you call a strat strategic planning department, and in theory you should be worried about. Uh, coming up with developing your strategic assets and your asymmetries and figuring out which markets to expand into but oftentimes you end up just being the secretary of the CFO and the financial planning market you're just you're just sort of collecting people's information and, and, and compiling it and um, so be care be aware of the difference between planning and strategy and make sure you're uh, uh, not just a, a secretary and the last thing I want to talk about is oftentimes they use consulting consultants to do the strategy. And one of my uh, partners at my consulting firm used to say, well, look, because to, to pay people to do this kind of high level thinking is expensive, but that's oftentimes more than a lot of the people in finance or operations get paid. So you have to outsource it. I don't know that I totally agree with him on that regard. It's kind of his self-interest to have people outsource it. But there are different ways in which you can use consultants and I can talk about that. One, one example is 
um, to help you refine your thinking is, uh, is good, but to have your, um, to just sort of give them an open-ended assignment, what, what should we do? They oftentimes don't know because that requires some, uh, some theory about what works and what doesn't, and that's some industry specific experience. So it's best if it's a sort of a, a work with relationship, not outsource your strategy to them relationship. So that's a bit on strategy and competition. I hope you found this uh, helpful. And if you'd like to see something like this presented live, please contact me at keithwhite.com for a proposal. I look forward to doing business with you. Thank you.